When you're in a time of desolation, don't change your plans. That's not the time to change directions. You keep going forward. I know that at the point I'm being tempted, Jesus is there with me. I know that in the place that I'm suffering, isolated, alone, afraid, that I'm being assaulted by the, the lies, the feelings of, of worthlessness, brokenness, purposelessness, Jesus is standing in it with me. He stands beneath the accusations with me so that I can face them with him. I'm not seeing a Bible <laughs> here. What do you do? Well, Jeff, <laughs> I'm the computer science guy. Yes, you are. I, d I really don't use a paper Bible very much. Except for the great adventure one. Well, yes. Okay, we'll go on to one. another topic. That's good. <laughs> right there. A big thank you to today's episode sponsor, Christ Medicus Foundation Curo. CMF Curo is an affordable Catholic health and wellness alternative offering a health sharing option, wellness coaching, spiritual direction, and a Catholic health community rooted in Christ's love. What do you do with 40 years on, on your hands? That's a lot of time. Not a lot of entertainment, no pyramids, no big dances or, or big reunions. It's the desert for 40 years, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. When you look at a Bible timeline chart, you'll notice that tan section, not very big, but boy, a lot happened in that period. Moses was used by God to lead Israel out of bondage. And after they were free and they went through the Red Sea, well, they ended up down at Mount Sinai. Everything changed at that point during that year. Moses received the Torah, the word of God. They were started eating the manna in the wilderness. Then the other big thing that took place at Mount Sinai was the Levitical priesthood. Remember, way back with Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, God made three promises to Abraham, land, a royal dynasty, and worldwide blessing. And so after the Exodus, we're looking for the land, and it looks like they could leave Sinai, go up and take the land, but that's not what happened. What happened is they went up to a city called Kadesh Barnea. They sent one spy from every one of the 12 tribes up into the land to see if they could take the land. And they were up there, they came back and they gave a report. 10 of them said, no way. And as a result, God said, all right, for every day that you were up there spying out the land, you now will wander for a year in this wilderness. And guess how many days they were up there? You got it, 40. For 40 years, they're going to be wandering around in this wilderness. And the, the goal here really, God says, is very clear. And he says this, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Father Boniface, it's good to have you on the show. Great to be with you, Jeff. Thank you. It's good to, it's good to, uh, to have you with us talking, especially about the desert. You know, because when you think about some Benedictines and, and you, you think about that austere life of being out there in the desert fathers, uh, there's so much to learn there. We're going we're gonna to get into that. But getting to know you personally, uh, tell me a little, just a little bit about your story. And you ended up with a PhD in computer science. We'll get around to you becoming a Benedictine monk because the two don't seem to go together in a lot of people's thinking, but perhaps we're wrong. Well, I really grew up without any religion, and so when I was making decisions about what to study in college, as I chose to go to Penn State University, um, I enjoyed computer science, computer programming. My older brother had just graduated from Penn State in computer science, and so I had some sense of what that was about, and I thought I would become a successful computer programmer and make a lot of money and have a happy life. And then there were a, a few twists that were introduced as I went to Penn State mm -hmm. and um, was approached by a total stranger. Right on campus? On just campus. Uh, I was just sitting under a tree. I was reading a computer science technical paper, actually, and uh, a man came up to me and asked me if I would be interested in studying the Bible with him one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, although I had really no interest in doing that, I also was just getting a little bit more open to uh, things transcendent, philosophical, and mm -hmm. so I thought, well, I'd give him a try. And uh, over over the period of about a year, we we studied actually through the book of Genesis, 
chapter by chapter. And wow. uh, I really came to know his very authentic, his very sincere faith. And wow. Are you still in touch with her? Uh, a, a little bit, yeah. yeah. I've, that's amazing, though. That says something about the importance of witness and not being afraid to just approach someone. And if you felt like the Lord wanted him to talk to you, and look what happened, you know? And uh, so kudos to him, wherever he's, wherever he's at. Yes, a lot of kudos to him. Really a man of beautiful faith and part of a, a group that, that does that, introduces yeah. themselves to uh, students on campus and studies the Bible one-on-one. -on -one. Now, you don't look exactly like a lot of parish priests. <laughs> and I'm talking about your beard, your habit. Tell me a little bit about being a Benedictine monk and, and how computers fit into that for you, because you have to be stopped at airports. People are wondering, well, who are you? What kind of organization <laughs> do you belong to? They do? I, I certainly have met a lot of interesting people in airports. And uh, yes, people, uh, since the Benedictine habit predates many of our uh, traditional Christian symbols, like the rosary, by 700 years, uh, our Benedictine habits don't look uh, particularly notable to people. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of being associated with Christianity. So I have people ask me if I'm an Orthodox monk, an Orthodox Jew, a Zen master, a, 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 a Wiccan, uh, anyway, I've gotten just about everything. But mm -hmm. it always uh, provides the opportunity for a conversation about why I'm dressed this way and sure. what I'm doing. Earlier in my monastic life, I taught in our college and I taught computer science. So. I entered the monastery with a master's degree, but after I was ordained a priest, I went back to Penn State, helped in campus ministry, but also got a doctorate in computer science. So from 04 to 07, I completed my doctorate in computer science, and I presented internationally at conferences on computer security, looking just like this, and uh, often found out what everybody's religion was by the time that I had left the conference, because they all told me. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, technology is not something new that, for the Benedictines. Um, and we were talking about this at one point. This is really normal, isn't it, for a Benedictine as far as historically being on the cutting edge? Yeah, in 500 AD, St. Benedict was uh, providing his monks with a, with a stylus and with, a, with something to, to write on. Yeah, it was really uh, in a... In a largely illiterate society, these were not technical implements that normal people had. And this would be something that only the rich, the elite had. And also the uh, rich and the elite mm -hmm. sent their children to be educated by Benedictine monks. They were really keepers of knowledge and, yeah. and using the, the latest technology in that sense to read and copy books. Well, I want to get into the desert wanderings with you and the desert life, uh, obviously. Uh, one of the loneliest periods in salvation history, and that is when Israel went from the busy, busy, busy life of being uh, enslaved in Egypt, which was really busy, to suddenly they're out in the wilderness. They don't have a, a quota of bricks they got to they gotta make. Um, they don't have a job that they are reporting to. Life is very different. Moses is the leader, not some taskmaster. And so we're making this transition. Now they have gone through the Red Sea. They have headed down to Mount Sinai, and they're going to be there for a year. And then they break camp. They're going to move up. They don't end up trusting God. God sends them into the land for 40 days. They said no. So God says, fine. For 40 years now, you're going to wander around in this wilderness. Starting from that point, Father, what do you think God's intention is here? What do you think God is trying to do with these people who said, no, we don't, we don't trust you. Yeah, you divided the Red Sea. Yeah, we're eating manna, but up there, uh, I don't think so. So what's in God's mind at this point? Well, if I, if I can, Jeff, I'd like to put trust on a spectrum. Okay. Can we say that they trusted God some? but not as much as they would be able to. Sure. And, I, and I think that it's, uh, you know, St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote The Life of Moses, seeing how there was a whole template for the spiritual life and, and as a spiritual director, and this is the space I live in, but God is always drawing us into a deeper relationship with him to the point that we can really be one with him, the unitive way, the fullness, the culmination of our spiritual life. That requires a lot of trust. 
So they have a little bit of trust, but maybe like that man in the gospel, I believe, help my unbelief. I trust, help my struggle with trust, my doubts. And, and I think we really see God bringing them through. There's a whole kind of pedagogical approach that God has with the Israelites in the desert, that he's giving them chances to trust more, and then they struggle. He's always bringing them up to the edge of their trust, we might say. And then we see the ways that they struggle. And of course, we see ourselves in that, which is why it's such a, a a beautiful meditation for us to enter into some of these passages, even at the level of the personal mm -hmm. spiritual life. And of course, God says basically, "I'll, you know, don't worry, I'll take care of you." You know, their 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 clothing we didn't wear out. He said, uh, I'll, "I'll provide manna, food for you." It might not have been the menu they wanted, <laughs> but he said, "I will, I will, uh, I will feed you. I will lead you by day and night, and you have nothing to." Fear. It sounds to me in some ways that this is, uh, in, in a way, it's like a, a desert paradise. We don't have to worry about anything. God's going to take care of us. But life seems to come into the equation there where they start to doubt. Why would a people who are being taken care of by God in the desert, no longer part of being slaves in Egypt, what would cause this consternation in, in the heart? Yeah, that's our humanity, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think, too, in the way that you described it, isn't it a little bit like what children grow up in in a good family? The parents are providing for everything, yeah. and yet the struggle to trust in every dimension. Sure, you provided for me for the last five years, but will you provide for me tomorrow? And as we as we grow and become a little bit more independent, and, and in the desert, um, you know, the busyness of, uh, of Egypt and slavery, the kind of suffering that was there sometimes prevents the self-reflection, the self-knowledge that's possible. Uh, going back to some of our discussions around technology, when you can just constantly watch the next YouTube mm -hmm. video, the next TikTok, the next thing, you never stop enough to face yourself. But I think in the desert, they also encountered some of their own weakness, some of their own limitations. With the, the restlessness of their own hearts, the disorder, the woundedness that has a way of coming to the surface. When did they ever have an example that they could trust in their lives? Uh, and so I think a lot of those kinds of things come out and then it really tests our trust. And God is a good father, uh, lets them struggle and, and lets them reach some of their limits and, and gives them remedial paths by which they can trust and then leads them steadily forward in this loving way. The way you worded that, it, uh, I appreciate that. It, it, you know, it helps me to see it a little differently than I've, I've looked at it in the past. And you, you think about the slavery, okay? Uh, the slavery they went through in Egypt was, was brutal. And they were told they had to make so many bricks, the men. And then the quota was raised to the point where literally the men couldn't even go back to their families. And y y it's hard for people to to get a hold of their own identity and who they are if dad's at work all the time. Dad is at work all the time. Plus, just the idea of a husband and wife getting together, you know, and loving, loving one another. All of this was, was dysfunctional. Um, the, everything that goes with slavery was hurtful, painful, dysfunctional. Uh, so they, they took all of that into the wilderness. Hmm. And I don't think people, Father, think about that that often. I think they're thinking, hey, it's all over. We're free. You know, let's go out there. Let's have a great time, you know, which they did, unfortunately, at Mount Sinai. They had a big party, and <laughs> that didn't work out so well. But let's stay on this one topic for just a, a little bit about bringing your dysfunction into the desert. Because people today do struggle with that, don't they? They, they might have been wounded. They might have gone through very difficult circumstances, whether it was in a relationship or a job or their emotions or whatever it is. And it isn't until things quiet down they suddenly realize, I got problems. Mm. I've got problems. What are some of the problems that, that you would see in people today that would be similar to Israel suffering under bondage and then suddenly here they are in the quiet desert. Yeah, I just think about their experience of power in Egypt and how destructive, oppressive, exploitative that power was. And now they have uh, Moses, 
who was powerful enough to overcome Pharaoh. And although they hear the stories, they don't know exactly God and all of these things, it can seem very much like Moses could be another Pharaoh. How do we trust him? And those kinds of wounds that we carry, having been uh, hurt by power in certain ways, then can make it very difficult to trust. How, much, how long does it take to prove that one is faithful? How long does it take to prove that one is loving, gentle, trustworthy in a different way than power has been in the past? Those kinds of things can be very difficult. I imagine, uh, just as you described, fathers that were not home, parents that were not much together, and children that grew up in these circumstances lack the emotional affirmation that we need to, to really feel that we are a gift, that our life is a gift, that we are valued by somebody. Mm -hmm. In fact, children may have felt like a real burden to their parents. It was hard enough to carry through the, the necessary work in order to provide for the family, and here's another child on the way. And a child could really enter into a family feeling like a burden, and then do I really trust when there's already that kind of mixed reaction from parents. Mm -hmm. And then God is really fitting into a lot of these kinds of parent models. He's taking care of the Israelites or the individuals like a parent, but then there's this kind of tense relationship with what parents mean and who I am. And so a lot of these things come into our, our religious experience and we develop certain kinds of God images around that. And, and that's not something that can just be corrected with uh, intellectual uh, discoveries, but really needs to get into the flesh a bit more. And those things get lived out over 40 days or over 40 years. Sometimes we have to live that out in steady provision. How long did it take with God providing manna every day that the Israelites really trusted in their bones that he would provide manna tomorrow? Right. I appreciate so much what the, you know, the Catechism talks about God as Father. And God is not like a father. You know, he is not um, imaging a father. He is father. He is a father. And so he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So during that, that period in the desert, God is God, yes, God, but he's a father. And these are his, these are his, his children. And it's in the desert that he wants them to know that he's their father, that they can rely upon him. And so one of the things that they receive in the desert earlier at Mount Sinai is the Torah. They receive the word, the word of God. And the timing couldn't have been better. Certainly the more sin, the more Torah, the more uh, you are disobedient, the more God has to direct you to try to, to hit the mark, you know, righteousness, which Paul said ultimately they never did completely. Jesus came in and did that. But the word of God in the desert. Talk, talk to us a little bit about the role of the word of God in that desert, mm -hmm. that quiet time when God is trying to father mm -hmm. his people and get you to trust him. Yeah, and if I could uh, reframe or present the word in the sense of what God is revealing is not something extrinsic to him, but really something intrinsic to him. He's really revealing his own heart mm. in a more partial way than he would when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we get the full experience of him. But, but it's a first step in friendship, self-revelation, and God is reveal revealing the pattern of love which exists within himself. That's what he's giving to them, not a bunch of rules to follow because he's another Pharaoh who wants to exact from them a taskmaster's uh, imposition, but, but rather it's really the pattern of his own heart, the way that he loves, and thus the way that they can learn to love. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of uh, in John 15, Jesus gives some qualities of friendship to lay down one's life, so even to the point of giving our whole life for the friend, to do what I command you to really trust, but because I've revealed everything to you that I receive from the Father. And I think we see in the word already that self-revelation of God. He's teaching them how to live as he lives, really to anticipate the new commandment, to love one another as I love you, which we couldn't fully understand till the Last Supper and, and the cross. But that begins with the, with the Torah. God is, is really opening up his, his heart and, and revealing himself to mm -hmm. them. I like that, that's, that's beautiful. When you, uh, when you think about it like that, it's very different than God imposing and controlling you. And, um, and sometimes people accuse us as Catholics as, well, your religion is one of rules and regulations. That's what you're all about, rules and regulations. 
But it's not, is it? It really is a continuation of God fully revealing himself in his son, Jesus Christ, and, and then giving us a home to live in, and certainly the word. But we're not really a religion of rules and regulations. It's more relationship, right? It's all relational. God is in himself relationship. Yeah. And so as he draws us into that very relationship, which is love, a love that is so strong that it, three persons are truly one God. It's, it's amazing that we could have such a love and be part of such mm -hmm. a love. And, and if we see a great person, and I imagine a lot of our viewers, when they, they look at you, Jeff, and they say like, how could I be more like Jeff Cavins? And mm -hmm. if you wrote a book that said, these are the principles by which I live, and this is what orders my heart, and these are my priorities, probably a lot of people would love to buy that and uh, model themselves. This is really what God has done. He said, here are the rules by which I live. Here is, here is, here is the ordering of my heart. Here are the principles so that you can become more like me. Mm -hmm. And then you're really going to experience that by being in relationship with me. So yeah. he's giving them a pattern, a logic by which they can understand the way that he is accompanying them in the desert, protecting them, providing for them, even punishing them, the remedies that he provides when they don't trust, when they struggle, and he provides a path, and he's giving the logic by which they could understand, put words to all of that and, and, and a pattern to it. You know, I remember reading years ago uh, Maimonides, and great Jewish scholar from, from of old, and talking about how coming out of Egypt into the wilderness was a time also of dealing with addictions. Uh, and that he even mentions that at one time Israel even struggled with the, the worship of sheep. And hmm. of course, they came out of a place where they worshiped everything. Hmm. You know, they worshiped the Nile, they worshiped the sun, they worshiped the bull god, they worship, it goes on and on. And when you, when you, when you come out of a country that worships everything, and you get involved in it yourself, and then suddenly you are not in that country, but you're in the wilderness where there doesn't seem to be anything to worship anymore, and you might have to you might have to create it yourself, like a bull god, you know, made out of out of gold. How does the desert deal with the addictions in our lives? I know a lot of people watching this show that are they struggle, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be. Let's talk a little bit about addiction, the wilderness. When we pull away, as you said, suddenly there's nothing to worship. When we pull those things away, and it's, it's really the first kind of big phase of the spiritual life, what later would be called the, the purgative way, mm -hmm. that uh, part of that purgation is removing some of those things that, uh, that tempt us or that we cling to. Um, when I think of all of these different gods, I really appreciate the concept of a value hierarchy. Sometimes we, we get a little bit too black and white, but really there are gradations of things. Sheep are good. Uh, they're not the most important. They're not the highest good. So getting things in the right place in the value hierarchy is kind of what we're, we're always doing internally to a certain degree. But when we pull some of those things back, if we can live without something, we've shown that it's not the top of the mm -hmm. value hierarchy. This is not the one thing necessary. And as we pull a few things back, it's the kind of thing that we, we tend to do during Lent, our desert of Lent. And the Israelites, of course, lost a number of things. As much as they lost the oppression, the slavery, the overworking, the, uh, the, the disenfranchisement of Egypt, they, they also lost a number of other creature comforts, the, the leeks and the garlic. I was just gonna and, say, that. <laughs> the leeks and the garlic. And so living without those things, then they have to adjust. And, and that can be very hard. I mean, uh, you know, quitting alcohol, cold turkey, or, or some other addictive substance can really put our, our bodies through shock in a way. One of the great supports for that is community. And the fact that they're doing this together is a great help for them. And they're doing it together under the guidance of uh, one like Moses, who's mm. really a holy man. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that through Moses and, and guided by God and his word. And then they have this proper worship that's being introduced. And so there are a number of things that go together that support them, but, but some of the things that they learn to depend on in Egypt, those addictions get removed and then they feel the, the pinch of that. That is a good thought that they, they're doing this as a community, as a, as a family. And what would it have been like if it was just you? Just you got brought out into the, into the wilderness. That'd be a whole different situation. But like anything else, the gifts that God gives us, Moses, for example, and his leadership, and uh, Aaron, 
And we, we can begin to find fault. We can begin to find problems with our, with our leaders. And certainly uh, the children of Israel are finding fault with the gifts that God is bringing in their life. Yeah, we're, uh, we're so good at that, aren't we? We are. And that, that goes back to that trust question. I mean, we, we come by our distrust honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a lot of reasons to not trust things that are very flawed because guess what? All of our leaders are sinners. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Moses and Aaron were, were human and limited in their weakness and then maybe even in sinfulness in intentional ways, you know. But, but uh, our leaders are, are limited and, and the gifts are limited. One of the things that Gregory of Nyssa gets into in the life of Moses is this idea of God always drawing us to more. One of the things he wrestled with philosophically was how finite and infinite could actually come together. But God constantly reveals the infinite through the finite. And so on the one hand, we experience the limits of the finite. And uh, Moses didn't have all the answers. He had his own shortcomings. The, the manna didn't taste great all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the desert was hot and silent and difficult. And we feel, we feel the, the limits of that. But, but God is always pouring the infinite through that. And as we discover him in those gifts, uh, then, then it opens us to, to long for more. Our hearts are made for the infinite. And so when we, when we get him through the, the leadership, through the word, through the, uh, the, the movements in the desert, then it does open us to a, a greater desire for what we actually want. Another way to describe addiction is trying to fill an infinite hole with a finite substance. Mm. Uh, we never get there, of course. So we have to allow the finite mm -hmm. things to become openings to the infinite, to God sure. himself. And then ultimately you become addicted. You know, you become addicted to these these things that you're trying to pour into this 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 infinite whole, the the soul. And uh, I think it was Saint Augustine said that our soul is in the shape where only God can can mm. fill can fill our life. Well, moving this down the road just a bit, this brings up another issue, and that is that for the children of Israel in the wilderness, they've got the Torah, the Word of God. They have the tabernacle, the the presence of God in the midst of them. They have the Levites surrounding it. Things seem to be pretty, going, going pretty well. And I would imagine that the people, you know, sure, they, they find fault with, with Moses. And his own sister did, found fault with him right there. You know, the family squabble in the, in the wilderness. You, know, you don't need that. But the people want to trust in some way. They struggle with it. But then suddenly we find out, Moses messes up too. And what do you do when you're in the desert and you're struggling with your own pain, you're struggling with your own inadequacies, and the one that you think should never make a mistake, father so-and-so, brother so-and-so, whatever it might be, they fall. And that leaves you even wondering about the whole journey, mm. you know, at that point. A little bit about when leaders fall. In, uh, and the impact that it might have on people and how does, how does somebody deal with that if they're in a desert and suddenly someone in their life that they thought was really a gift suddenly became human. <laughs> yeah, well, it can be so devastating. And uh, we certainly have experienced that in so many ways in our, in our world at, at secular levels as well as at sacred levels. And uh, then, it challenges us in a, in a way, thinking of that value hierarchy again. No leader is the top of that value hierarchy. Uh, mm -hmm. No leader is the one thing necessary. So every leader is mediating God to us in, in limited ways through, through his limited humanity. And uh, so we try to receive the, the God, the infinite that's coming through him rather than getting stuck on the finite form through which it's coming. And, but that's a real challenge in faith. And, and, and God understands that and, and provides in different ways for us to be supported. And, and we need uh, other signs of community and other movements of trust. And, but it can really be a, uh, lead to a kind of dark night for us mm -hmm. that the things we thought we could really hang our, our hat on, that we could really rest the weight of our life on, don't support us. Uh, and, and it challenges us to, to go beyond those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, it never excuses the behavior. It doesn't. Uh, we we uh, we have to work through forgiveness many times, and but it can really be a, a purification that keeps us from depending on certain things that seem to be in our own control, and to let go and realize God is always greater. He's always drawing us into something more, and 
challenges. I remember years ago, Father, I had the opportunity to go into the Sinai Desert, and I I, uh, I lived with the Bedouins in their tent, and mm. and uh, one night we were going to begin a climbing Mount Sinai at two in the morning because you'll you'll get to the summit at about six in the morning, and we were going to celebrate Mass at the with uh, Father Michael Scanlon mm. in Steubenville. But before we broke camp at 2 in the morning and started to climb, I went outside of the tent at about, I don't know, 1.30 or something like that. And it was so silent mm. in the desert. It was so silent that I could hear it. And it was almost, it was other. I, I never experienced that type of silence in my life before. And I can't imagine 40 years in the desert in that, in that type of silence. From your experience, and I know you've counseled people as a priest in formation about uh, two things. One, what do people generally discover about themselves when they enter silence? Uh, and the other is, what do they discover typically about God? And what's God, what does God want them to discover? Because he wants to disclose himself. He wants them to know who he is. What do they, what do they typically discover about God? What do they discover uh, about, about themselves once they're in that place of, whew, this is silent. This is different. Well, I, I think that depends a little bit on uh, where the interior of the person is. Some people who are, are relatively... Uh, I don't know, healthy interiorly enter into silence. And while at first it's a, a little bit difficult, sometimes I think of it like hot bath water. You know, you sort of like dip a toe, whoo, and then uh, rest a foot into it and then settle into it. And then quickly it becomes very soothing. Uh, other people uh, discover that, that as a lot of things start to come up, uh, fears, uh, anxieties, voices, uh, self-doubt, uh, feelings of, of worthlessness, and sometimes the interior becomes so loud, it can be, it can be hard mm. to enter into that without some more support to, to counterbalance those things. It can be good for those things to come to the surface, but it takes a certain, a, lot, a certain amount of psychological stability to enter into really silent places. Sure. But that, that caught my attention when you said that. You talked about how you're in the desert, it's quiet, but what's happening inside in the interior is so loud that it can it can mess you up, you know that and and uh, I never thought of it quite like that before. And so there's so much chatter, so much entertainment, so much social media that I can't help but believe that some people are actually craving to get away. Yeah, I think we could even uh, equate that in some way with the oppression of the of Egypt. That there's a kind of imposed chatter, and you have to keep up with a certain amount, and make more bricks and more things. And mm -hmm. there's a there's a real uh, busyness in all of that. That that God, when He wants to form His people after His own heart and develop a relationship with them, He pulls them out from all of that and then brings them into this place of silence. Mm -hmm. A place where they have to learn to trust in new ways and communicate in new ways and listen in new ways and worship in new ways and love each other in new ways. It really is a place of formation, but he needs to pull them out of all of that intensity, the, the, the city, the power, the projects, the work, the, all of the stuff of Egypt in order to bring them into that place of formation. Even as a Benedictine monk, like, do you, I mean, everyone looks at you, you know, they'll look at you, they'll look at your habit, and, and, uh, and they'll look carefully to make sure you're not walking six <laughs> inches off the ground, you know. Does your life get cluttered? Do you get so busy, you're, you're not uh, uh, immune to this, are you? Are you or, or do you get busy? <laughs> and cluttered. Do, what do you do in your life when you feel like that? Yeah, it's a great question. Anybody who knows me who's watching this is laughing right now because uh, <laughs> I, I do a lot of things. You know, I, I think one aspect, and even you could relate this to the word monk in some way, monikos, meaning one, that I try to do one thing at a time. I think that also helps. I think part of the constantly moving to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, we don't actually land on the current thing. And, and one of the things that's really fostered by the rule of St. Benedict is 
that the divine presence is with us. So already now, really the sacrament of the present moment. And so I try to really be present whether I'm with somebody in spiritual direction or whether I'm writing a book or whether I'm reading a book or whether I'm in prayer or whether I'm on my way to the divine office or whether I'm praying the divine office. I try to be present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that has a way of ordering the, the interior. Uh, but mm -hmm. I do also certainly take times of retreat, times of prayer. And, and, and in the structure of an ordered life, which I, I live, there are a lot of things I don't have to prepare for myself. I know where I'm going to be this time, the next time, it really frees up the interior to, to commune with God in the midst of even a lot of yeah. things. You, when, the, when we uh, study the, the desert wanderings, I tell my students oftentimes that when you're studying this fairly short period of time, 40 years in the desert, you have to remember that they are, God is working on their heart for sure, but he's preparing them for something. Hmm. And the something is, is that they are going to go into the promised land. And in that promised land, there's going to be Canaanites, there's going to be uh, child sacrifice, there's going to be families that want your daughters, and uh, there's going to be uh, parts of the land that are very busy. One of the things that I do bring up uh, about this desert wandering is that the place that they're being prepared for is a combination of both busier than all get out and lonely. And so, in the, you know, the land was promised to Abram, and it was a land flowing with milk and honey. And I've always bring, I always bring this out, anytime I, I go through the desert wanderings, is that that land flowing with milk and honey, if you, it, it really speaks of two lifestyles. If you took a watch, a regular watch, not a digital watch, but a regular watch with hands, and you stuck it right on top of Jerusalem, right around from two o'clock in the afternoon to about eight in the morning, everything to the northwest is, is a honey. And that's the honey of the date. Everything to the southeast is milk, and that's the shepherds, the herders. In the northwest, and they're, they're gonna be coming into this land. God's preparing them in the desert for all of this. Up there, it is noisy, big cities, party, predictable rainfall, very, very fruitful and fairly safe. In the Southwest, this is the milk. It is so unpredictable. It is harsh, little towns, very little water. Most people don't wanna live over there. So when they finally go through the 40 years, they'll be on the plains of Moab, ready to cross the Jordan and take Jericho. They're crossing at the point of still desert, but there's gonna be a goal. We hear there's some pretty good land up in the Northwest, and it's very rich and rainfall and the sea and all of that. And when they get up there, they run into a lot of trouble with the heart again, and they are pushed back to the right stage, milk. And so there's this battle between mm. milk and honey, milk and honey. And, and of course, Paul figured it out, and he said, look, I've learned to live with a little, I've learned mm. to live with a lot. I know the secret that I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in, in some ways, this time of preparation in the desert is for the future. It's not just about mm. now, right? That's beautiful. Yeah, and, and that's what God is always doing. And he's mm. asking us to trust him quite a bit as he asked them to trust uh, the formation program. It always makes me think of the Karate Kid. That's such a yes. dated reference, but yeah, no, you teach him to wash the car, paint the fence, and you know these turn out to be the, the karate moves that he needs. Yeah. And, and that's what God is always doing. He's teaching us so many things in the midst of our lives that we don't know how all of these things are gonna fit together, but he yeah. already has the vision of how they'll fit together. Yeah, and yeah, I have no idea why today it's wax on, wax off, wax <laughs> that's on. That's right. Wax, paint the fence, yeah. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden he gets into the fight and it all comes back. And this is what I was being prepared for. So any advice that you have for people who right now might feel like they're in that desert experience in their life, they do have a Bible. They do have a church to go to. They have people that they're learning from in, the, in their, their desert. Any advice on how to prepare for what's next in, in your life? How do, you, how do you go about being prepared for the next step? Well, I, I wanna highlight, first of all, the things that you just said. 
to have a Bible, to have a church, to have people to learn from, to have people to journey with, uh, that's actually a lot. I don't know how many people actually have that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and really holding to that, I mean, those are the, the necessary means. Sometimes we're tempted to just like go off on our own somewhere and then I'm supposed to figure it out and then have all of the answers. But we, we really do live this out in community. I think that's mm -hmm. such a beautiful aspect of the desert wanderings. And then I, I hope uh, our uh, words are an encouragement. You don't know all of the things you're learning right now. And, mm. and sometimes that is a matter of trust when one of the things you thought was absolutely necessary in your life is gone, and that's just slipped away. And maybe it's the trust in your leader, or maybe it's the, the job that you uh, were, were uh, depending on, or maybe it's even a family member, friendships, different things that, that go away and we find ourselves in a kind of desert. Sometimes it's experiences in our prayer, and that's a classic development in the spiritual life, that what I used to be able to do easily with meditation, I used to be able to pick up my Bible and I, I had a lot of insights and consolations and then that seems to have slipped away. Uh, God is teaching you something in this moment and you will come to know what it is. Mm -hmm. I learned a, a word from Pope Benedict, his, uh, the book that he wrote after he resigned from the papal office. Peter Zewald asked him, did you ever experience a dark night? And he said, well, not in the exalted way like the saints do, probably because I'm not that holy. <laughs> anyway, but he said, I discovered as I face difficult questions, things like evil in the world, the innocent suffering, things I didn't have an answer for, if I stayed inside of it, if I stayed on the inside, a light would open up eventually. Hmm. And I think that message of uh, perseverance, Peter Zewald said, does that always happen? He said, well, no, not always. <laughs> but even that it happens sometimes is something quite remarkable. Yeah. And so to stay in it, as the Israelites had to stay in the desert, remain in the journey. Uh -huh. and, and certainly we lean exactly on those implements that we have, on the scriptures, on the sacraments, on our friendships, and, and we keep growing in faith. Uh, as Ignatius said, a very simple guidance, when you're in a time of desolation, don't change your plans. That's not the time to change directions. Mm -hmm. You keep going forward. And that is such good advice. I think that people need to heed that, you know, that oftentimes people do make very critical decisions in their life in the desert. I'm going back to Egypt, you know. Uh, Don't I'm gonna, go back to Egypt. Yeah, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to Egypt. Well, you know what? They kind of marked your home. Your home, <laughs> your home had blood on the doorposts and the lentil. I don't know that life's gonna be like that. And and here's one of the interesting aspects of it is this idea of recidivism or going back to where God has brought you out of bondage. He's working with you refining you, getting you to trust him and know that man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But somehow you're taking comfort in yesterday. You're taking comfort mm. in the thing that you were screaming about, the thing that you were praying for deliverance, the thing you begged me to bring you away from. You're suddenly comforted by that. What is happening in the mind? You're a counselor. You tell me what happens in the mind of a person who is taking comfort in that bad relationship that was brutal and everyone was praying you out of it. You left it and now you're thinking maybe. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I'm always looking to the tremendous pain that's underneath that would actually move us to take consolation in things that at some level we know mm -hmm. are of minimal consolation and even lead to greater destruction. But there's a lot of pain underneath that. And the, those, are, those are deep pains of not knowing whether my life is really valuable, whether I will ever really be loved, whether anybody will, will actually help me, whether there, I have a future or there's a meaning to my life. I mean, it's deep pain, and it's not just resolved by intellectual concepts and, and answers at that level. It's really resolved uh, by, by somebody stepping in and beginning to, to demonstrate that kind mm -hmm. of love, show that kind of love, to live in those kinds of relationships. Yeah. Uh, it's just easy to fall into old patterns. The, as they say, the devil you know is better than the one you don't. Uh, and and we, can, we can fall into those, those old patterns which become more destructive for us. And Do you have any advice for anybody who may, let's say they call you up, say, Father Boniface, I, um, uh, I've got a friend, I've known this friend for a, a, a quite a while and things have been going south lately. 
you know, in their life, and they're telling me that they think they're going to go back to Egypt. What do I tell them? You know, do you have advice for people that would say, I know of people that want to go back to Egypt. Yeah. Deep down inside, I can't, I don't think they really do. But how can I help someone who wants to go back to Egypt? Well, yeah, the, the, the pattern that, that I've seen is uh, that, that deep pain mm -hmm. that, that leads to that. And so how do we get into that? Sometimes there's a temptation to deal with the surface things uh, and try to convince somebody that that's a bad idea. Or, but really to say, like, you must be really hurting. And tell me about what's going on inside of you, mm -hmm. and where are the fears that are there? And sometimes, depending on the friendship, you know, sometimes we are the ones who have let somebody down. Maybe we're aware of that to one degree or another, but maybe it's a need to apologize for that, a way that they needed us to show up in their, in their lives, and we weren't really there. Or mm -hmm. they started to trust in us, and then that hit a sensitive point, and now they're running from us. But anyway, pressing into relationships and being present to people and really being willing to invest and commit in people mm -hmm. is what strengthens and heals a lot of those more painful interior places. In the, in the time that we have left, I, I do want to visit the, the, really the answer and the standard for all of this, which is Jesus. And uh, I remember the first time that I really understood what Pope Benedict was talking about when he, when he was talking about this idea of recapitulative history, big fancy word for, for Jesus fulfilling all righteousness or Jesus going back into the Old Testament and reliving the stories and showing us you can do it. And I, th and I think we would be remiss if we didn't put out there the pattern, the success story of living in the desert. Mm. And the success story is not found in just some writer's book. The success story is a person, Jesus. And we have this wonderful recapitulation where where Jesus in Matthew 3 goes down to the Jordan River and John the Baptist meets him. He's baptized and he comes up out of the water and goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And it's in that wilderness for 40 days that he's confronted three times. And he answers the devil, it is written. And he answers from Deuteronomy 6 and 8, which... Our both chapters are where Moses brings up to the younger generation, your mom and dad failed. They failed these three major times, and Jesus is showing us you can live in the desert, and you, you, you can exist and experience victory in, in the desert. How does Jesus, from your perspective, how does Jesus show us the desert is possible? Mm. It is possible. Well, and I, I would propose uh, even a step farther than that in the sense that he does give the pattern, he lives it perfectly, yeah. but then he doesn't step back and say, now you live it perfectly. Yeah. He enters into it with us. He lives it with us. So we do, in fact, or he did, in fact, what he doesn't expect us to do. He did it alone, but he does it with us. And so I know that at the point I'm being tempted, Jesus is there with me and he is the one who can help me to work through the temptation. I know that in the place that I'm suffering, isolated, alone, afraid, that I'm being assaulted by the, the lies, the feelings of, of worthlessness, brokenness, purposelessness, Jesus is standing in it with me. He stands beneath the accusations with me so that I can face them with him. So I'm really empowered in him and supported by him to make my way through the desert and, and make my way through that healing. And ultimately, that's what he's doing on the cross. He's entering into all human suffering so that no one ever suffers alone. God has entered in Jesus Christ into all human suffering, and he transforms that suffering into love, into communion with mm -hmm. the Father, and he makes a path through to a life without end in a perfect communion of love. And so when I'm in those places, and again, in our humanity, God has designed us also to uh, be with one another. So uh, how do I experience the presence of Jesus? Well, well very much sometimes uh, through the grace of prayer, spiritual consolation. I'm with him and I'm struggling into 
interiorly and a, a light breaks through or I remember this conversation and I know that he's there. But a lot of times we experience that through our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a call for us to step into the pain of others and to be with them in their temptations and stand with them in the struggles mm -hmm. because we are really bringing Christ into that place in a tangible way. Yeah. And when we're in the place of struggling to reach out to others and to let them support us and be with us is also a way that we experience that concrete. That's way. beautiful. That that's, that nails it right there. You know, if you can, if you can remember that when when you're in the desert, that God is accompanying you. Uh, he's different than the Greek and the Roman gods who are above the clouds mm. and oftentimes make fun of you and yeah. use you. God says, "No, I'm below the clouds. Yeah. I'm with you. I am yeah. with you in the tabernacle, and mm -hmm. in, and in Jesus." Uh, God becomes one of us, Emmanuel. Mm. God is with us. And in the desert, if God is with you, then not only are all things possible, but I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And that, that's really the key right there. And I think Jesus mm. was, was definitely, def, definitely showing us that. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to look into your Bible study, how you go about studying the Bible. That's what we're all about with the Bible timeline, is, uh, is uh, studying the Bible, but understanding, well, not everyone's the same. Maybe you study it a little bit differently than other people. And I've been looking on the desk here, and I don't see a Bible, so I'm very curious <laughs> what you're going to be giving me here, but we'll talk about that right after the break. CMF Curo is a Catholic health and wellness alternative for individuals and families that offers what modern healthcare is missing. Curo offers an affordable and faithful Catholic alternative to the impersonal experience so many people confront when they need healthcare. Curo is fueled by the belief that each person is an unrepeatable gift from God. This belief informs its whole-person holistic approach to its health and wellness program. Curo provides personalized wellness coaching, spiritual direction, small group studies, Catholic community, and a Christ-centered healthcare sharing option. As you consider your health care needs this year, we invite you to prayerfully consider joining and learning more at cmfcuro.org. That's C-M-F-C-U-R-O dot org. All right, Father Boniface, now comes the time where we find out how do you engage in God's Word. Now, I'm, I'm sort of traditional. I've got a Bible, and I have my Great Adventure Bible, I have all kinds of Bibles, and I love getting into the Word of God with my, my uh, colored pencils, my markers. And uh, in the morning, my wife and I, every single morning, we'll read the Gospel together and do Lexio Divina, and we just love it. And I'm not seeing a Bible <laughs> here. What do you do? Well, Jeff, <laughs> I'm the computer science guy. Yes, you are. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Verbum, which is the, the Catholic production of the Logos Bible software. And there are just so many tools in yeah. this. And so I also do daily Lexio Divina. In fact, Lexio Divina is one of the real hallmarks of Benedictine life. Uh, and I love to read the Gospel of the Day, so I just scan the daily Mass readings. I click on the Gospel of the Day, and it brings me over into my Bible, which is all marked up. I have. Uh, is it really? Well, I'll, I'll bring We're up. We're gonna a, get a screenshot of that. A nice, uh, a nice passage, a passage. I'll, I'll share a little bit. So every one of those little uh, stickies there is, is a note. Uh, is a note, and I can just hold my finger on a word, and it'll bring up the Greek, and I can do a little quick deep dive into that, and discover some of the other places that word exists and some of the nuances on the translation. And I love to track a few of those things down. I actually have to be careful to limit myself in my prayer, not to do too much Bible exploration just at that time. But I do like to dig out a nugget or two and that often inspires So we're looking at John 21 reflection. here. Is there more in your Bible than John 21? Where is it? I, <laughs> I, is that, is that, that's a short... Bi no, I'm kidding you. The, the, you know, a, a lot of people do use electronic 
Bibles, you know, digital Bibles. And you have Bibles, plural, and commentaries and so forth. I, too, have uh, Verbum, and, and I use it to study uh, a lot with. Now, you're, you're not forsaking paper, though, as a Benedictine monk, are you? You know, you still have a paper Bible? <laughs> I do. Please say you I, do. <laughs> I, I even have a uh, Great Adventure Bible, but... Uh, um, I, d I really don't use a paper Bible very much. Except for the Great Adventure one. Well, yes. Okay, we'll go on to one. another topic. That's good. <laughs> right there. No. Okay, so you, you actually do mark in here. We'll get a screenshot of that a little bit later here. But you, you actually do mark in there. In that, how, how, how many notes do you think you have in your Bible? Is that the way it is all the way through the Bible? You got all kinds of... Certainly through the Gospels. I've been praying daily with the Daily Mass Gospel for well, out of a decade and a half or something. And so I'm constantly running into all of my own markings. And then more broadly, the, the first reading, I'm very liturgically oriented. Sure. So it's always my starting point. So where there are liturgical readings, there are uh, underlines and uh, notes and a lot of things mm -hmm. happening there. Yeah. And there's also, does that all, that all transfers over to your phone too? Yeah, so I I'm, I'm, uh, always have my... My phone, so even if I'm stopped in an airport or in a bus station or something else, I can bring up a uh, verbum and I can pray a little bit from the from the scriptures. Aren't you fancy? <laughs> no, I know, I know, I, and I love it too. You and I were talking earlier about uh, technology, and I have a whole note-taking system where I use text files to um, keep track of and future-proof all of my research and all of the work that I'm that I'm doing. I. It's, it's hard to find people who aren't part of tech at some level. It's life, you know, uh, the way it is. It's like when the book first came out. Someone said, oh, you're carrying around a book. How? Now that's just weird. <laughs> you know, where's your parchments? <laughs> I'm so used to parchments, you know. But um, that's great. Okay, so out, out of all of the, the, the characters in the Bible, one of the questions I love to ask people is out of the characters, all the characters in the Bible, who, who would you say your favorite one is and why? I mean, it's really such an unfair question. <laughs> There's uh, so many reasons to love so many of them. I, uh, I wrote a book on St. Joseph and uh, also I'm just to have a 33-day consecration to Our Lady coming out. So it's hard not to love them. Uh, and they're really my mom and dad. Sure. And so I do have a great love for them. Uh, this John 21 is, uh, is one of my favorite passages. I love Peter, and uh, as he develops also in the Acts of the Apostles, this, uh, this beautiful transformation. So I've had a real fixation on some of these stories recently and have been uh, digging into that quite a bit. Yeah, that John 21, that was the chapter that... So I go to Israel a lot. I just finished my 60th pilgrimage. <laughs> and uh, it was probably about pilgrimage number 50, where I was up on uh, the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the north, Capernaum area. And man, I, I read that, John 21, and it was Jesus taking Peter right back into the group who Peter had denied the Lord three times, said, I'm going fishing. This isn't working out. I'm going to go back fishing. The disciples said, me too. We're going to do it as well. And then who shows up on the north shore? on a charcoal fire. Last time Peter was at a charcoal fire, things didn't work out so well. <laughs> and there's Jesus saying, come follow me. Lech acharai, come follow me. Mm. And, I, and I remember reading that, and I'll tell you what, it hit me emotionally mm. like it never had before of, Lord, you know me, you know everything, and you're still asking me to follow you? I've denied you. It was in front of everybody. And now you're still asking me to follow. Oh, that really, that really hit me too. What about your favorite mm -hmm. verse? Do you have like a? Do you have life verses? Like I have a, I have one life verse, but I have some favorite verses. What about you? Oh gosh, that's a great question. I, I, I float to so many different things. I, I haven't nailed down something I would call a life verse. I'd say this uh, John twenty one passage is, uh, but but so many different points along with that. The. The, uh, the charcoal fire. There's so many words that are particular to John that are in yeah. that passage. So like anthracia, apsarion is the little fish. So they only ever occur in the New Testament in John 6, when Jesus multiplied the little fish. Hmm. Uh, and then also the word to draw in the large catch, it's the same word to draw 
uh, all men to myself when I'm lifted up where the Father draw him. That verb is only used in John. The, uh, and then of course this beautiful dialogue of uh, do you love me and with mm -hmm. agape and uh, phileo. And uh, so anyway, there's so many different dimensions of that, yeah. that chapter that, that really draws me because the, the basic pattern that, that speaks to me and is a, a, a good description of my life, I suppose, is, is really Jesus drawing Peter to face the, the depths of his failure, poverty, his limitations, so the charcoal fire, his limited love, mm -hmm. uh, his lack of apsarion, his the great catch of fish where he's gone astray, just really bringing him face to face with his own limitation yeah. and then just loving him in that, showing his mercy and then calling him to do things greater than Peter could have ever done yeah. to take care of the sheep and the lambs. I'm curious if you saw this when you were studying John 21. We're getting off, off topic, but it's fun, it's Bible. Uh, in the Hebrew, when, there isn't a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. They take the regular alphabet, 22 consonants, mm -hmm. and they attach number meanings to, you know, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, so forth. And uh, everything, numbers are big among the Jews, especially in the first century. And uh, even under, in Jewish mysticism, numbers are, are really, really big. And it, it tells us that he caught a certain number of fish, 153. Hmm. And people are, will ask the question, well, that's an odd thing to put in there. I mean, who counted them? You know, just a minute, guys, 149, 153, you got 153 fish here. But uh, I remember talking to a, a Hebrew scholar who said, well, you know what 153 is, don't you? And I said, no, what? He said, every, every phrase or word can have a numerical value. And 153 is the numerical value, value of Ani Elohim, I am God. Ani, I, Elohim, mm. am God. The numerical value of Ani, Elohim is 153. Huh, and, that's uh, great. It's kind of a neat little insight. I've spun that a different way, which is not as, as uh, profound as what you just said, but getting into the experience of Peter, why was he counting the fish? Because the alternate was that he would face Jesus at the Anthracia. Oh. And so when Jesus says, do that's you have good. any apsarion? Now, in fact, they had only caught Ichthon Megalon. Uh, there weren't any Are you upsarion. Are speaking another there. language here? <laughs> <My mess. laughs> they, only, <laughs> they didn't have any little fish, but only the great fish that they had uh, uh, had in their catch. But here's Peter uh, has to face that he doesn't have what the Lord is asking for. He uh -huh. only has these sort of great fish. And then he has to face him at the charcoal fire which he doesn't particularly want to do. So yeah. I imagine him losing count several times. <laughs> That's an interest. I never thought of it like that. That's an interesting insight. I know that I would have done that. <laughs> I would have, found, I would have. Every, <laughs> found every excuse not to go back to that fire. Oh, so gosh. we meet again. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Hey, we've got a bunch of questions that uh, people have submitted to us. You know that uh, Father Mike and I did the Bible in a year, and during that year, uh, we would we would take a lot of questions that came in about all the different parts of the Bible, and now we have the opportunity to, to address some of those, you know, as people are going through the various periods like the desert, the desert wandering. So you're ready for the, the challenge? <laughs> Give it a try. You are ready, okay, <laughs> right. Okay, so, and these questions come from uh, a lot of the people who, they're in Ascension, presents world, you know, and they're studying and they're, they're learning to be a disciple and, and so forth. So we have first questions from Sammy. There are quite a few figures in the Old Testament who do a lot to serve God. However, it seems like many of them do it more out of duty or because God promised them something. Did the Israelites believe they were loved by God and could be in a relationship with him? Well, uh, Certainly, the, uh, the Lord wanted to draw them into that relationship. And as uh, we can see, the, the word being the revelation of his heart or the pattern for life. And, and I think even in Moses, that, that Moses, who is uh, eventually is leading them out, eventually comes to really love them in a way that he advocates for them. And insofar as they could see him as God's representative and he is intervening for them, uh, and 
they, they could experience the, the love that's there. So that, uh, of course, the, the great commandment that Jesus refers to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and then the other which is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And those, uh, the, the Shema, that central prayer of Israel, the first that a father would teach to his son, is certainly in the context of love. It's uh, not as full as we would come to understand it in the New Testament when we see the love of God revealed in Christ and even Christ crucified. Yeah, it's but, a little more obvious. There. I'm also reminded, Father, of uh, the prophets. You know, the priests taught. They had 48 cities to teach from. And then the prophets would come, and the priests taught. The prophets moved the heart. And, and typically, they'd move the heart back to God. You're not doing what the Lord told you to do. But there are many instances where it is very intimate. It's very personal, mm -hmm. the message. Like Hosea says to mm -hmm. Israel in the north, God is your husband. Mm. God loves you as a husband loves you. He wants to take you out into the wilderness and love you. And you have Song of Solomon, you know, Song of Songs, and, and so beautiful, beautiful psalms that, that really express a, a tenderness of, of love that is beyond mere commandment and, and obedience like a, like a slave, mm. right? Yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, Oh, well, the, the, the merely a duty aspect of it never quite worked. It was only by drawing him back, uh, drawing Israel back with bands of love, as Hosea says, from the desert, actually, through the desert, uh, that, that God would continue to draw them, not simply imposing on them like a taskmaster, but yeah. drawing them into a union of love. That's good. Our second question, Jim writes, after Moses saw God face to face on Mount Sinai, it says that his face was radiant, so he would again put the veil over his face. Why didn't the faces of people who saw Jesus in the New Testament also become radiant? Or why don't our faces become radiant when we look at the Eucharist? Now, I know mine does, um, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's a good question. It's a very good question. Just to set the stage for that, Moses did go up in the mountain, and he even explains it as seeing kind of the backside of God, and his face became radiant just because he was in the presence of God. And when he went down, everybody noticed it. It's like the year I was in Denver, Colorado at a wedding, and the day before the wedding, I, I went to one of these tanning booth places. And you can tell that I am <laughs> light-skinned. And let's just say... For the wedding the next day, I was a color that the world had never seen before. Okay, now that's different than this. That mine was stupidity. <laughs> Moses was was with God, but that is an interesting question. the The basic thing is that there is more happening inside of us than entirely gets expressed. As much as the body is the language of the soul, we also know that there's a disintegration between body and soul that will eventually result in a rupture and we will have a glorified body as uh, the Lord raises us from that. And then the body will perfectly express the soul. So at various points, God gives us a, a little glimpse of what that would look like. And the transfiguration is an example mm -hmm. of how we saw Jesus unveiled. We saw the radiance of his divinity. And even that is, of course, only an approximation uh, that we could handle. But uh, sometimes God allows those things to, to break through and, and to uh, allows them to be seen. Now, it is actually, as the West has, has experienced, uh, and I mean the Western church, the Roman church has experienced things like the stigmata from some saints like St. Francis or Padre Pio more recently, where the confirmation to the suffering of Christ was so deep that it actually appeared in the flesh. Other saints and, and all of us to a certain degree are conformed to the passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. But in their case, it actually showed up on the flesh to, to, so that we could see. In the Eastern Church, uh, someone like St. Charbel being the most recent, there is actually the illumination of the faith, a light that shines from the inside. And this is captured also on Byzantine icons. There's no light source on the outside. The Byzantine mm -hmm. icon always has the light source from the inside to indicate what we will look like in eternity. So sometimes that breaks 
through. So for various reasons, God wanted that to be seen in Moses, but it isn't a kind of necessary consequence of a holy person or gazing on yeah. a holy person. Because otherwise the disciples would have been glowing 24-7, <laughs> so, so to speak. <laughs> Lit up like lamps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Okay, so we are, our next question from Ezra. Nice biblical name. I have been developing a really strong interest in the, Mos in the monastic life. As I read about Moses, it seems like his life, or at least parts of it, resemble monastic life. I am not sure if that is accurate, but would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, it's a, a great connection, and that is the beginnings of monastic life. Uh, there were a couple of before, but the celebrated founder of monastic life is Anthony of the Desert. And having heard the word in the church, in the Mass, uh, if you would be perfect, go sell everything and give to the poor and then come follow me. He was struck by that. Uh, and it was a, uh, compelled him to go into the desert, very mm -hmm. literally, into the Egyptian desert. And, uh, and then he lived a, a solitary life of communion with God. And in a, a lot of the ways, uh, as we've discussed, he, he had to battle his own inner demons and he had to face the things in himself. He had to face the, the challenges of trusting in God and had to live that out with God. And so the desert as a place that we grow in intimacy with God and enjoy the kind of mentorship of him is certainly something at the foundation of the eremitical life. And then that developed into what I live out, the monastic life, the communal or cenobitic mm -hmm. monastic life in which uh, we would do that also as a community. And so that's even closer to what the Israelites experienced. They weren't solitary in the desert. They were communally in the desert, living under an abbot, uh, uh, Moses, who's the Abba of them in a, in a certain way, the father of them, and then living according to a rule of life, uh, the Torah in this case, the, sure. the, the law of God. And that's precisely how St. Benedict describes monastic life. And not all Benedictine monks are descalced. You, that's a, a big fancy word for this guy likes to go barefoot, right? And that is the, the not wearing shoes. Is Tell me a little bit about, about that, which goes along with what I think he's asking. Uh, not wearing shoes, where does that come from? And is it something that you always do? Because I'll tell you what, Father, you moved to Minnesota. We're going to test that <laughs> really quick. <laughs> well, and, and to be clear, uh, we, we don't necessarily have a discalced tradition in the Benedictine order. Uh, the discalced is usually, uh, we think of the Carmelites, the OCDs, the Order of Carmelites discalced. But, uh, but certainly sandals, St. Benedict provides for and Jesus provides for the wearing of sandals. And so uh, we, we do that. Um, but that would, uh, even removing the sandals, of course, is what Moses was mm -hmm. called to do before these desert wanderings in his personal encounter with the Lord at the burning bush, that he was in the presence of God and he should remove his sandals in, in reverence to, to God's presence. I think uh, part of that is uh, the, the sandals have dead animal skins, right? And so to, to remove anything that would hinder uh, anything dead, uh, maybe we could say, uh, that would that would interfere between us and God. I think uh, Gregory of Nyssa reflects on that. And so we we remove these dead practices, these dead parts of our lives, these these places that lead to death in order to make ourselves vulnerable to mm -hmm. to to encounter God. Throughout your average day, do you do you walk around without sandals? Um, Oh, well, I often am in my office without sandals, but no, I normally am wearing sandals. Just in this house, everybody removes their shoes, so I was happy to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, Timothy has a question. And Timothy asks, he says, Father, back in the time of Moses, was conversion a thing? For example, did the wife of Moses, Zipporah, convert and become an Israelite? Or did you have to be born an Israelite in order to be part of God's chosen people? It's a good question. It is a good question, Jeff. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, start, I would start off by saying that uh, in order to become a part of the people of God, you, you could only come in one way, and that was through circumcision. And, uh, and, and typically, at least during this time of the Desert Wanderings, there wasn't this idea of people coming in and, and joining, joining up, up with them. But if you were to become 
a member of the household of God. It was through, it was through circumcision. And so after the 40 years of the desert wanderings, they, they apparently did not circumcise during the 40 years. So once they were done and they, they came uh, across the Jordan River and they, they stopped at a camp right outside of Jericho, that's when the men born in the wilderness there were circumcised. They were circumcised at that, at that point, which was the sign of the covenant that was given um, back, back at Abraham, with Ab Abraham's time. And so, you know, for the most part, I think that the, the children of Israel were more of a secluded group of people, that there wasn't a, a, a clear pattern of outsiders coming in and becoming members. The only time we really see it is like, for example, when they came into the Promised Land and the Gibeonites, and they made they became a part of the people of God, but it was through covenant relationship. It was a covenant. They made a covenant, and they actually lied a little bit about it, but that the covenant was made, and they were a part of of, of Israel. So it's not like today where the, you have a, a pattern of people converting. Uh, and I think part of that is, is that it's this thing we talked about earlier, the preparation. Israel was being prepared as God's firstborn among all nations. God didn't choose Israel because they were the best or the biggest, or the fastest or the richest or the best looking or anything like that. He chose them, yes, as his chosen people. But he had plans beyond that, the nations, the nations. And so this is the forming of a people for the purpose of going to the nations. And there, so you have two different paradigms. One is we're the formed people, we're the people of God. If you're interested, come to us versus the pattern of Christianity, which is, yes, we are God's people. We are the family of God. We're coming to your town. We're, we're, we're coming for you. You know, we're going to bring the love of God with us and we're going to tell you all about, uh, all, about, all about Jesus. So I think that Israel was really in a preparatory phase as the people of God. And, but their laws were all geared towards treating other people with justice and kindness. Mm. Even the laws regarding slavery which is not a slavery like we know slavery in the, in the modern era, mm -hmm. but the, one of the signs that Israel was a, a, the people of God was how they treated people and the foreigners was, was quite different than, than most cultures during that time. So even for those who weren't converting, there was still a treatment of them, which was not merely the insider against the outsider, right. but a real relationship by which their relationship with God would also be a positive influence on those around them. Right, and benefited those people uh, on, the, on the outside. I do think that the, the, question, the question reminds me of our duty as Christians to go out in, into the world and that we are not a people who just study and meet together and somehow hope the world's going to get it, is that we're, we're men and women on a mission. And, uh, and now that God has fully disclosed himself to us and revealed himself to us and empowered us, it is for mission. And it is for the future to, to go out and to, to you know, share the gospel. You're saying that to a monk, Jeff. Yes. <laughs> I know. Do I need to go out? I'm here to change history. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Monks were part of the early missionary movements. Yes, yeah. And uh, taking the gospel to England, and then also my own patron bringing the gospel from England to Germany and evangelizing much of, uh, of Europe, re-evangelizing yeah. France. So even the monks yeah. go out. Annette says, uh, let's see, she's asking, if Moses was raised as an Egyptian, would this mean that he was not circumcised? Well... I can. You want to answer it? I just learned from you, Jeff. That <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, you know, Moses was was it was circumcised, um, and you have to remember how Moses came into the into the story, is that the Egyptians wanted those male children that were born to be drowned in the Nile, and the mother of Moses, when she, when he was born, uh, she put him in a little ark, another circle around you know ark of the. Uh, Noah's Ark and the little ark in the Nile, and guess who found the little baby? It was Pharaoh's daughter, 
And she came down and she knew that the baby was a Hebrew. How? He was circumcised on the eighth day. And that's how you could tell a, a Hebrew boy was, was he was circumcised. And so she drew him out of the water, which is what his name became, Moshe, mm. which means to draw out. So not only, not only was he uh, drawn out of the water, but it spoke of his vocation as well to lead, lead Israel out, out of this bondage. Uh, it just strikes me as you share that how beautiful the devotion of Moses' mother was to God and to his identity mm -hmm. as a member of the chosen people because by circumcising him, she was marking him for death. Yeah. And still, it was more important for her to identify him with God and, and maintain his identity, the covenant, than it was to try and preserve his life mm -hmm. in some, some compromised way. Yeah. I've never thought of it quite like that. That's that's good insight. What did I say again? <laughs> that was good. That's really good. That's why I love talking to talking to to you and and so many wonderful people that we have on the show because I get to learn so much myself and you never stop learning. You know, there's always it's infinitely always deep. more. Any closing comments that you have? Anything you'd like to say about the desert wanderings as we get ready to round this up? Wrap it up. Gosh, so many things. Uh, but uh, maybe if I could just uh, make a little appendage to some of the discussion we had about the Torah to note the tabernacle as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is designed according to a heavenly pattern and then with uh, uh, this worldly implements. But again, it's really a revelation of the heart of God. It's a way that he shared himself with his people. It can start to seem a little abstract. You're reading all these things and this long and that big and mm -hmm. the other thing, you know, this kind of wood and that kind of thing. And it gets a little bit confusing, a little bit like the law it gets all, all these details. But, but I think seen as the, the self-revelation of God, the opening of his heart. And, and Gregory of Nyssa said, well, if it had a heavenly pattern and then an earthly reality, uh, what is it? Well, it's Jesus. Mm. So ultimately fulfilled in him who had entirely a humanity and an earthly reality, but was of course also the eternal son of God. And so mm -hmm. we already see these prefigurations in the word, the Torah, and also in the tabernacle, the one who would tabernacle with us. And so just see that great love of God, which yeah. I think is so beautiful to know that he wants to draw us into that kind of friendship with himself. That's beautiful. Father, could I ask you to, just, uh, to close, uh, close the show in prayer and give our wonderful students of the Bible a blessing? I would be delighted to. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great love that you have for us that you reveal your heart to us, that you give us your Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, make us one with you. Deepen our love for your scriptures. Continue to open up new horizons, insights, and personal revelations for us as we study these same scriptures. Strengthen our communities and make us one with you in love. And I ask you to pour out your blessing upon all of our viewers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.